Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is, in response to I think Garvit's request or Bharat's request, that uh, we show you how to place these bracket orders. Okay, so you can place bracket orders, and that I think that's a good thing because it will put you into this habit of thinking constantly about <coughs> the stop loss and the take profit. Okay, so initially we'll train you in that manner. Later on, I'll show you why you don't even need a take profit. Okay, that's, so we'll remove one element of the problem. Uh, so let's do that. Let's try and place um, a bracket order. So one of the ways you can do that is you can just say, let's say I have a bracket. I want to buy Maruti. Okay. So I'm not even going to look at the chart. So I just click on the offer. Okay. So I have a limit order set up. Okay. So what I can do is maybe. So the limit order if the market price of Maruti is 55.21. The limit order to buy will be above or below. Right, everyone's clear about that. So it's below, okay? So it is, uh, it's below 5521. So let's make it like 5501, okay? So we have an order to buy at 5501, all right? So now this is your plan that you want to buy Maruti at 5501 when the market is trading at 21. And now you're going to place a bracket, let's say it's only 400 shares. We're going to change this obviously to GTC, okay? So these parameters are okay. Now, before I transmit this, I can right click on it and do an attach okay and I can just see here there, there's an option yeah so here that you see that I have the option of bracket orders so the moment you click on bracket orders the system is very smart you see that your initial buy order was 5501 right so that remains and then the bracket orders are both sell orders the system is very smart because you chose bracket orders so and automatically you can see that one of those one is a limit and one is a stop you can see that right although it has maintained both are sell orders both are 400 shares so the system has also maintained the equivalence of amounts because it saw that your limit order is 400 shares okay so therefore it has also maintained the equivalence of amounts is that clear okay so everything is taken care of now all that is left for you to do is and it's also maintained the GTC from basically from wet what you said so make sure you set all the parameters and the limit order first okay and then you can set this okay so uh, then when you've got uh, this everything is set so all you have to do is you have to now which is the take profit here the limit or the the limit one is the take profit right so this should be higher than 5501 or lower higher okay so let's be very ambitious and let's make it like 5700 okay so we want to take profit at 5700 okay and then at 5501 we want to put a stop somewhere okay so the stop the stop this is called the stop trigger level okay this stop level is called the stop trigger level okay uh, and the this is called the limit price level you can see the prices a little better okay all right so the stop trigger level this should be below 5501 or above below, below 5501 okay so let's make to be very simple let's make it like 45 uh, no let's make it like that's too much actually so let's make it 49 uh, 50 okay just whatever I mean you can have it at 49 also but okay so is this clear now so we are listing about 50 50 rupees per share 51 rupees per share 52 rupees per share okay around 50 rupees per share is our risk is this clear okay and you can see here that the I'm following the general uh, advice that I gave you we will look at later on we will look at how you can uh, make this more systematic the multiple uh, the choice of the multiple okay which is that essentially you can see that the take profit is very big okay the targeted uh, profit is very big compared to the targeted loss is this clear Sorry. so this is the broad principle that you have to follow yes you have the mic it's 550 per share oh yeah 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 sorry sorry it's it's it, this is not i read this as zero essentially yeah, yeah. so this that has to be um, good good tarun is very observant okay so this should be five four five zero right okay good very good so at least we know that somebody is paying attention to the detail right okay 
so um, and det attention to detail is very important because when you are placing orders and stuff like that you may make mistakes okay so uh, right so is this clear now what was i saying so the idea is that the size of the take profit is very big compared to the size of the stock okay now how big that we can look at there are there's no you know fixed answer for that but the general idea that is always should be very big the take profit should be much bigger than the stop loss the size of the stop loss this principle should always be followed okay how big we we'll look at there's no fixed answer but we we'll look at how we can determine ways we, ways in which we can set that in a more systematic way so all everything is clear now yes. okay now all you have to do is you have to just transmit one of the orders yeah, let's just click on transmit okay and i'll just show you one more thing before we uh, uh before we look at the what is here it's a session outline yes Garvin. this is i think too much Sir, yeah. my question is that if the uh, price uh, does not reach the first limit and uh, reaches the uh, reaches directly to the second limit, that is five seven uh, five thousand seven hundred. So the shares will be sold. one minute. One minute. Oh, sorry. Let me. If the price, so here we have uh, understand the structure of the bracket order. So the bracket order is I I discovered that they don't let you enter bracket orders with market orders. Okay, you can only enter it with limit orders. Okay, so you can either use this technique that I've shown you here. Okay, and uh, or, or you can use uh, there's another technique through the order entry uh, dialog box. Okay, so we are using this. So this is good enough. Then you can figure out for yourself if you want to do order entry. But this I think is more structured. You start with a limit order plan and then you put a bracket order sir. okay yeah now what's your question yes sir my question is that uh, as the we have put the price of limit five zero uh, double five zero one but okay. the share price is five two one uh, five five two one so no, it's five five two three yeah five five two three if the price rises to five seven double zero four zero uh, as we have quoted so my shares will be sold or not no that's no so the character is a good question okay detailed question you understood his question yes, sir. he's saying that if before enter exercising your limit order you have to enter the position whether if the price goes directly to 5700 okay whether the 5700 sell will be executed yes Parul, what is your view how can it buy at 5501 when the price is 5700 what Garvin's question is if the price reaches directly to 5700 okay if the price goes see here the now the market is 5523 now when the market is 5523 I placed a buy order at 5501 okay so what Garvin is saying is that what if it never comes to 5501 it goes directly from 5525 to 5700 will it get executed or not Yes. No, let's see what Parul has to say first. Mike. Is there can be a reverse order like first? No, no, no. Let's don't ask another question. First, answer Garvin's question. Yes or no? Hmm? It will not execute. The 5700 sell order will not execute. Anybody else with a different view? Yes. So everybody feels that it will not execute, right? Yes. No, no, don't give all these uh, questions. Simple question that Garvet has asked that if the market goes directly from 5523 to 5700 without ever coming down to 5501, will the 57 or 5700 sell order be executed or not? Simple question, yes or no? No. no. I'm asking Chuk now. He's asking all kinds of questions. You, you're, you're supposed to answer this question. Yes or no? Okay. All right. Okay. So they are right it will not execute so the structure of the bracket order is that the limit order is treated as a is given a pre it's a primary order okay so the bracket order exists only to cover the limit order so unless the limit order is executed in the first place the bracket order elements will not execute okay this is clear the bracket order elements of the bracket order only kick in once the limit order is executed is this clear is everyone following some of the faces are not very encouraging Yes, yes. They, they don't seem to be uh, enlightened faces. Yes, like Burma, uh, British, the faces are not enlightened. Okay. So now what we do is everyone is following? Yes. yes sir. Okay.
so I just have to transmit this one okay and I'll give you some messages about equity with loan and all that here you can look at some of the questions one of the questions that uh, Chuk was focusing on what is the value of my position okay if I'm planning to buy 100 shares of uh, Maruti this is the value of my position estimated commission okay you have to actually go to the IB website and read up the commission structure this is part of your training whenever you're training uh, whenever you're trading with any broker every book broker will have their own commission structure okay so you have to one of the things you'll have to do is go to the website look at the commission structure and there are some variable elements to the commission structure like you get the, this concept of volume discounts okay so if you're trading a large volume of shares it's not a simple formula like just one rupee per share or something like that because if you're trading a large volume of shares beyond a certain threshold you will get a volume discount so the formula for writing the brokerage on a particular trade is not going to be simple when you write it in a spreadsheet it's not going to be simple because it has to take cater to the volume discount are you following what i'm saying right yes. you're not following you don't understand what volume discount is yes, sir. if you buy one laddu if you buy one laddu it's 50 rupees but if you buy 5000 laddus you will get a discount it's not going to be 50 rupees per laddu right so volume discount there's a moment i said laddu she's thinking or answer sheet what marks she'll get okay now uh, is this clear volume discount okay so which means that formula is not going to be simple if you buy 5000 laddus you just can't multiply 5000 by 50 they will have to you have to factor in the volume discount when it clicks in so maybe after five after if you buy more than uh, 1000 laddus you get up you start getting the volume discount so you no, it's not really like market lot it's not exactly similar to the market it's just simple volume discount I think all of you are familiar with business in every business transaction with the concept of most business transaction will have a concept of a volume discount that on your first hundred uh, units you will have to buy at this price it depends on how it is structured it can be structured in different ways right so this is the concept of a volume discount so the point I'm trying to make here is that when you program the brokerage element of the uh, of your when you are projecting the brokerage uh, as a function of the uh, of the size of the position it need not always it won't be a very simple formula because most brokers will have volume discounts so you'll have to program that into your uh, spreadsheet right okay so you can get an estimate of your commission okay and then you just transmit okay and this giving you the normal warning about the stop order okay it's just warning you because stop orders have some problems because you may not get the uh, the point here is that essentially they're talking uh, telling you to look at the risk associated with stop stop orders the problem with stop orders essentially is that even though your stop is at 5450 okay the main risk they're warning you about is that if the market actually goes to 5450 okay the eventual execution of your sell order for 100 shares at 54.50 may not eventually get done at 54.50 it may get done much lower it may get done at 54.25 okay 54.20 54.50 so there's no guarantee so there's the point about the stop order which we'll see later on when we understand the stop orders we look at the various types of orders right now we've only looked at the definitions of the orders right give her the mic she does she really needs a mic <laughs> throat is not in good condition yes yes I heard the first part so if it is not going to execute if there's no guarantee of execution at 5450 yeah there is a point we'll explain that when we get into the details of the stop order okay there is a point because if you don't even have a stop order then the process the point of the stop order is at least that at 5450 the process of selling your shares will start if you don't even have a stop order there's nothing to even start that process the market is just moving against you and you're on holiday right so there's no uh, so so there is a value to the stop order we'll see what happens uh, when we look at the details of the stop order so is everyone clear now how to place bracket orders okay so it's a good way to approach your uh, uh, your uh, trading you can just look at the market uh, form of view okay and then uh, like here had gone in here so if you place a limit order whatever even if you want to buy now here place a limit order here place a stop loss maybe here or here this is actually logically more correct and then place a take profit much much higher okay all right so we got this element cleared okay the uh, the element of the bracket order here yeah yeah 
Uh, sir, I was asking that um, at uh, 54 that you price said that the order will be placed. But if I You're talking about the stop now. No, no, no. Yes, sir. The order, <laughs> is, the order okay. will be placed. But. Uh, no, 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 one second. Which one are you talking about? The stop? Yes, sir. Okay. But uh, when I get to know that, uh, when I just need to buy at 50 book, if, the, uh, if I assume that the market price has gone to 50 book, 50, then I need to buy just now. My order will be placed uh, right now only, you know? No, 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 one minute. I'm not able to follow the second part. You're talking about the stop order. And yes, now you are talking about a situation where the market price goes to 5450. 54.50 and okay. uh, my stop order is being placed at 5450 but I got to know that the market price has gone that much. But uh, uh, if I place the order at that time, if I go to the market or I go to the broker and I place order, uh, order at that time, my order will be uh, processed before that or after that? I want to ask. No, no, I am not able to follow what you are saying. But first of all, you don't operate like that. See, if you have already placed a stop order, Order, yes. at 5450 we are ignoring the decimal here okay but if you have already placed a stop order at 5450 you notice that all three are green yes sir. okay order is waiting to trigger okay so all three are green so therefore uh, the broker is already watching a stop order for you at 5450 now when the mark when the market actually goes to 5450 you don't have to again go to the broker and tell him to sell because you've already given him instructions. These are a conditional instructions that you've given him, right? That if your temperature goes above 32 Celsius, then switch on the AC. Then you don't have to separately when the temperature goes to 32, they again have to go and tell him, please switch on. Sir, in that process, that if I have told the broker, he switches off late, but my switching off is early. So no, no, I can go and switch There's no late. You can't be faster than the broker by definition. Because, I just wanted to ask. No, you can't be faster because you already told him this order is being watched by the broker. So as soon as the trigger, as soon as the trigger price is hit, which is the market trades at 54.50, as soon as it's triggered, okay, the basic structure of structure of a stop order, okay, we haven't even defined market orders fully yet, but the basic structure of a stop order is that uh, the way it works, it's like a conditional market order, okay. That as soon the way the system understands it, now you'll get to th start thinking in terms of system logic as well. Okay, uh, that is the the system logic for a smart stop order is this: that as soon as and because it's a sell stop order, so I'll discuss it in the from the selling point of view. Uh, so as soon as uh, the market hits this 5450 trigger, okay, the system is going to watch that trigger being hit, and then the system will immediately react by transmitting a market sell order. Okay, so basically what a stop order is, is nothing but a is a conditional market order, which means it's not a pure market order, a pure market order will immediately go in and sell. Okay, so what a pure market order does is it immediately goes in and sells. Okay, so if I have a pure market order to buy any say HDFC, okay, I may not be able to get it at 81.40, but as soon as I transmit, immediately the system will go into the market and buy. Okay, but it will buy at any price. It will say whatever the market price is, I'll buy it, not necessarily at 45. It could be better than 45, it could be worse than 45. That's a market order logic. Okay, immediately go into the system, uh, into the market and buy at whatever price is prevailing in the market. Okay, that's the market order concept. And then the related concept of the stop order is that a stop order is basically a conditional market order. It is not directly transmitted right now, but because you've given him a condition. When the price hits 54.50, then you sell my 100 shares. So essentially what the system will do, once this trigger is activated, right, the market trades at 54.50, the system will transmit a market sell order. Okay, and that's why your price is not guaranteed. So we're going to come into that. Are you following now? Okay, so you can't be faster than the market because you've already placed it now. Okay, it's not humanly possible to be faster than this, than the technology, right? Are you following? You don't seem very convinced. Yes, sir. What is the? Yes, are you convinced or not? Yes, sir. I am convinced, but I am not convinced that it is not possible because it's check, check. because if we go on, uh, if, we, yeah. if you see that, give him the mic, yeah. <laughs> the technology will be selling at a lesser price than this also. Then why should I go? No, 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 no. Because see, there is also the concept of queuing. So, essentially, the the. The system is watching the market prices, okay? As soon as the market trades at 54.50, so you can't get to know before that. So 
you and the system get to know at the same time when the market trades at 5450 and now think about it you can only interface through the system you can't directly put your hand into the server and manipulate it right you have to interface through the system so think about it that both of you get to know at the same time that the market has gone uh, at traded at 5450 so in that case the system has already got a pre-programmed logic that I have to sell I have to transmit a market sell order for 100 shares so the system has already done it in a few minutes milliseconds right then if you are trying to beat the system you have to then again enter a sell order you have to again click on this and enter a you have to do all this market sell order okay and you can keep it as day itself it doesn't matter then you have to click transmit so you can't be faster than the system are you convinced now yes sir. okay good that's a much more con uh, your voice is filled with a lot more conviction okay is everyone clear now yeah. good so yeah but it's good that he's asking all these questions because whatever questions arise in your mind you should ask otherwise you don't get to really learn everybody has to learn in their own way that's why it's really important to attend class because you get to ask questions okay so yeah so feel free to ask questions okay yeah sir if we are dealing with 1000 or 2000 shares mm -hmm. so when we uh, uh, initiate a buy order so it, it takes some time 5 to 10 seconds yeah if they are. so if uh, the market if there is a huge slump in the market downtrend and the price is falling uh, with a huge uh, pace in that case if we are selling the system is selling the order and it takes some time if it taking time in buying then it will yeah. also take time in selling yeah. and in that case when the transaction is in between the price fall to say 4 Four five three zero. Oh, sorry. Yeah, four five zero something around fifty three hundred. Yeah, yeah. So in that case, my order will be sell on four five five zero in between. Yeah, whatever it gets. Okay whatever it gets because when the system is transmitting orders to the exchange server there are other people also submitting to the exchange server that's where the concept of speed comes in how fast does your system order go to the how fast can this guy TWIB communicate with uh, NSE the NSE server okay so now there are other people that's why people were trying to co-locate their servers with the NSE servers because they want to get those milliseconds advantages okay so uh, that's where now there will be a concept of a queue so the NSE server will look at a queue so as soon as the price goes below 54.50 a whole bunch of orders are being transmitted some may be buy some may be sell okay so some orders are being transmitted so as if you look at the sell orders alone the market sell orders there will be a queue system applied okay so the, the NSE server will execute the order on a first in first out basis okay in the queue okay so who depends on how fast your broker has been able to transmit this into the NSE system okay so eventually that's why in any market order and remember stock order is nothing but a conditional market order okay so eventually it operates like a market order once the condition is activated okay so therefore that's why there's no guarantee in a market order there's no guarantee of the execution of the, uh, there's no guarantee about the price at which it is executed it could be anything if the market is falling sharply that's why they warn you when you're using stop orders that's why they warn you because they may want to make sure that you understand that your stop order need not be executed at this particular stop trigger level it could be much worse it depends on what the situation is that is one of the reasons if you remember i've told you to always operate if you're trading indian equities and if you're trading in india what i tell people is don't bother trading all these stupid currency markets and all which they have on the nse they're like a joke basically okay so the only market in the in in india that is worth trading is the cash equities market okay nse bse that's a liquid market pretty liquid market more liquid than anything else okay and there too i have told you to confine yourself to the nifty 50 shares don't go into all kinds of uh, big uh, companies which are listed okay because the the volume is not very high those are not liquid stocks so when you try to execute stops on those stocks you can have a lot of this is called slippage okay this concept is we are learning about something new so i'll just put it into the so this concept is essentially called since we are um, today is okay so bracket orders we covered bracket orders I'm going to use the shorthand okay market shorthand for orders is 
ODAs. Okay, bracket orders we covered. What else did we cover? Okay, I haven't come to the other part. We're looking at the execution, but basically we're covering market orders also. The market orders and stop orders okay so uh, what was i going to tell you this um, okay slippage the concept of slippage uh, let's look at the concept of slippage so slippage is basically the difference between um, stop order trigger level you understand this is the stop order trigger level Okay, this is the level which the system is watching okay uh, so that it is it's going to transmit the market order only when this is when this trigger is activated and that is the market trades that level and final price at which okay are you following the concept is clear the example that uh, Bharat is giving your trigger is at 5450 but maybe there's heavy selling in the market and you're selling a lot of shares okay uh, maybe the final uh, execution might be at 4500 even you don't know there's no guarantee anything can happen okay can markets can move that's another thing in the markets is there are no limits okay as I, I mean the exchanges set some limits like five percent circuit breakers and all that which I think is kind of stupid actually because but uh, this is what most people do most exchanges do that even in the US they do it okay but I think it's a anti-free market concept the market should be allowed to operate it for 20 percent fine that's that's the market that's life okay but uh, anyway most exchanges have some circuit breakers but it can still drop a lot okay so the market is shut off. Yeah, they halt trading for a while. They halt trading for a while and then they the resume. Regular, uh, shares or regular yeah, whatever, whatever the market. You can have circuit breakers in individual shares, in stock index futures, in commodity futures. Okay. So in certain cases where there's a massive mismatch of supply demand. Okay. So here we say when you have so everyone understands what circuit breakers are, yes, sir. right? Circuit breaker is essentially where you there's a massive fall in the share. So the share price falls 20% in a single day, the exchange will stop trading. Okay, that's why essentially they're saying this fall is too much. There's panic in the market. Let's try to reduce the panic by stopping trading and see that maybe people have a cup of coffee, they, feel, they become a little more relaxed. Okay, so that, that's the idea. So, but in situations where you have uh, in, in the commodity markets, okay, we've had cases in the US and in, the, in years past, where if there's a severe supply demand imbalance okay because basically the supply price is moving sharply why because there's a severe supply demand imbalance okay there's a uh, you know either way okay so you have these situations so when the price is stuck uh, when the market stops trading okay we say that the market is locked limit down okay so when we have operations of so this is slippage you understand okay so uh, we have what circuit breakers Circuit Baker stops uh, market operation, essentially trading. Okay, okay. So we say that the market is locked, limit down or limit up, whatever it is. Okay. If the price has fallen, we say it's locked limit down. If the price has risen, we say it is locked limit up. Okay. So the market is locked in the sense it can't trade because the exchange is not allowing trading. Okay. So then if you have these situations like so when you have severe supply, supply demand imbalances you have cases in the in the US in commodity markets where the market has been locked limit down for three days in a row. So what happens is like uh, one day it drops say, let's say 10% and that's say limit on a commodity price okay. Then you lock the market you stop trading so the market is locked limit down the next day it opens and again goes 10 percent down again okay and again next day it opens again it goes it's just showing that the market is there's a severe supply demand imbalance okay so uh, it would have been better in my opinion to have the market drop and let it drop 30 percent in one day in fact i think it creates more panic we never know really what will happen but uh, i personally i'm not a fan of these kind of methods i'm not a fan of anything that interferes with the free market because i think these are stupid measures basically uh, so anyway but that's how the operate uh, that's how it operates in most countries in the world okay so, so this there is a circuit break in market it hurt. so at, in that case we can uh, set new orders and we can uh, apply new uh, no. yes. 
That you will have to see with the broker agreement because it might be uh, that depends on how the then you have to really go into the fine print of the uh, technology arguments uh, agreements between the broker and the and the exchange because there are some problems here because if I've already transferred the order as soon as the price went below 5450 it may not have locked down limit down immediately right so as soon as it went below that my system logic has already transmitted the order from the uh, broker server to the exchange server okay so I think what you're looking at is you're situating you're looking at a situation is like suppose the price is locked lock, limit down goes to 4500 and is locked limit down can you cancel this stock order and place another order that's what you're thinking right so there may be some I would suspect there may be some problems with that because uh, you have to see the agreement between the broker and the and what the broker tells you, you have to really look at the fine print of this situation okay because uh, there is going to be a problem because the transmission of this order has already happened now already gone to the exchange server now what does the exchange do you have to really look at the exchange policy with respect to uh, days when the market is locked limit down does it cancel all the sell orders okay the exchange has an incentive to do that because they want people to reconsider right because if there's a selling panic and there's lock limit down and you guys have sell orders what the exchange would really like you to do is basically reconsider your sell orders and maybe not sell right now so that the selling pressure is relieved so but you have to re uh, difficult to say in advance what will happen you have to really look at the exchange agreements with the broker what the broker tells you to do uh, in these kind of situations okay so there's not a clear answer to that right this is clear okay all right okay are we are we following now i hope you guys are not switching off we are getting some good questions okay so it's helping you to understand uh, the the nuances of the subject okay all right so what else that we've learned some new terms market is locked limit down or limit up we've learned about circuit breakers okay we've learned about slippage everyone is clear about slippage okay so essentially the reason i tell you to go for liquid markets okay is that in liquid markets we expect low slippage is this clear in liquid markets like uh, if you look at currency markets or if even in India if you're looking at these are the most liquid markets we have in India the cash equities market but only the top shares okay that's why I tell you to confine yourself to the nifty 50 so that you're trading in liquid shares so you understand this concept of liquidity essentially that the definition that we gave is the ability to sell large volumes or transact in large volumes without moving the price okay so it's consistent with that definition of liquid markets so liquid markets you have low slippage that's why when you're running a speculative trading program okay like you're managing a fund or something like that it is better to stick to liquid markets because one hopes that you will use this methodology of stops to control your risk and when the stop is triggered if you are trading in an illiquid market you can have very high slippage is everyone clear about slippage yes, sir. it's an important term okay that uh, and so therefore that's why I tell you to operate in liquid markets because it will control your slippage and at the end of the day when you realize this whole business of trading being able to speculate uh, without you know blowing up and losing all your money the most important way you control your uh, you know your risk is through stop orders okay by which limit your risk on each trade and by having low slippage you are able to ensure that your actual loss is close to your budgeted loss you understand budgeted loss we did the concept of budgeted loss that you take your initial capital whatever your risk capital is okay say whatever 50 million rupees or whatever it is okay then you carve it up and I said you take only 1% you know we can look at other methods later on about how to arrive at that 1% you take only 1% of that 50 million rupees and that should be your maximum risk on each trade right so that's what I'm talking about when I say budgeted loss so this budgeted loss is the 1% of your total risk capital which I've told you to should be the maximum risk on each trade that's your budgeted loss so based on that you place the stop actually I haven't got into this but actually what you should do is you should factor in a little bit of slippage in your uh, budgeted loss in the way you uh, size your position okay so although you will place this or uh, this uh, stop that you place is based on the actual breach of the high and low which I showed you yesterday right that you look at the chart and you see where the high and low is like here if I'm placing this stop on the T on TCS I will actually read off what is the low over here what is the actual low 
okay and if the low is 2027 then I will place it at 2026.95 uh, are you following 2027 if 2027 is the actual low then I'll place the stop trigger level will be 2026.95 because there's five percent by say increments right it's trading in five percent five by say increments so because two zero two six point nine five is the first point where it is lower than two zero two seven are you following the same thing we went through yesterday right which Shuk was asking a question about why can't it be equal to two zero two seven but equal to is not lower than okay we need to have a lower than we need to have a lower low to break the trend condition so in the case of we are uh, dealing with huge amount of shares so that in, case, in that case we will uh, set stop loss at 20 more than something more than 2027 to uh, no, no 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 you can't space it more than 2027 so to minimize that loss no, 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 will, uh, no, no. you have to understand the logic one sec that's why i'm emphasizing this i'm emphasizing this point okay you can't place it lower higher than 2027 okay because what is the logic for placing your stop at below just below 2027 because 2027 is the previous low so only when this market drops below 2027 has it violated the condition of the uptrend are you following you can't place it above 2027 even though you think there might be some slippage because then you are uh, you are giving the order to sell your shares because the trigger price is the point at which you give the order to sell your shares right you're giving the order to sell your shares when the trend has not really been destroyed it has not been uh, the uptrend has not been neutralized are you following why have i bought i bought it because why do i have these 1000 shares long because i my view was that we see this trend in operation and it has not i don't see any evidence of it has been uh, of it having been neutralized okay so therefore i'm going to assume that of course i could have also assume that it is over but i chose to assume i looked at this trend this high is even higher than this high i see an uptrend going on all the highs all the lows are higher all the highs are higher so i choose to assume that whatever is going on will keep going on okay like you, you have newton's laws of motion like body will remain in a state of uh, rest or motion until there is some external force okay so i just assume that uh, it's going to continue in the same way okay so i chose to assume that so i should only exit my position so based on that i've gone long okay because i think it's going to keep on moving in this way that whatever low is formed over here as you can see when i bought it it was over here it did form a lower low compared to this but it never went below this low can you see that so the uh, the uh, conditions of the uptrend were never neutralized the conditions maintaining the uptrend were never neutralized or violated so the uptrend remains in place right so the only reason i want to exit my position is if the market shows me that it has neutralized the uptrend or destroyed the uptrend and that can only happen at we are calling this 2027 okay whatever the price is let's call it 2027 doesn't show 2027 but anyway so are you following what i'm saying okay so therefore you cannot place it above 2027 that cannot be your trigger to start selling the shares because you should only start selling when your assumption has been invalidated your assumption is only invalidated when the market makes a lower low than this 2027 level that we are calling 2027 okay we don't know what the actual low is are you following is everyone clear about this okay so you can't decide to place it higher even though you're uh, you are afraid there'll be some slippage this is clear so the trigger level still has to be on a discrete break of that previous high or previous low okay so in this case if it's 2027 then my trigger level will be 2026.95 right whatever be the in different in a different market the increment may be one paisa okay or one cent or whatever so you have to figure out what the increment is and then just next increment is where you place the stop this is clear okay everyone is following now what i'm saying when i'm talking about budgeting for slippage okay when i'm when i'm talking about budgeting for slippage okay you have to assume that there will be some amount of slippage so if you are triggering at five if the stop trigger is at 5450 you have to budget some reasonable slippage so you have to assume let's say that the actual execution of the stop will happen at 5445 maybe 
for that. No. Okay. I understood as you as talking about. But one minute. Let me come to that. But the trigger level will still remain 5450, assuming that this is a new low. Okay. The 5450 here is the equivalent of what I'm saying here is uh, 2026.95. Okay. The equivalent of that is 5450.4. That is meant to be the new low. Okay. Okay. Just the next new low. Okay. So this remain. This will remain the trigger level. How you adjust for the slippage is where you adjust the position size. Okay, we'll show you later on. We already showed you how to adjust the position size. Remember, if you look at your um, somewhere in your calc, we did this uh, calculation. Remember? Yeah, we did this calculation. Remember? So we are selling so many. Uh, this is your annual risk capital. Okay, so this is your annual risk capital. The 1% rule is applied. So 1% of your annual risk capital is what you are going to risk per trade. Okay. Entry price. Okay. Whatever be the entry price that you're planning. Okay. Entry price you can uh, guarantee if you, you do take some risk that what Garvit was talking about that you want to buy something. You want to buy something at 5501 when it is at 5521. Well, it may never reach 5501. It may go straight to 5700. That risk you take. But otherwise, using limit orders, you can guarantee the entry price. Okay, so you enter at 83. Okay, and you exit at 68.5. Now, here is where this is when you are doing the budgeting of your uh, when you are actually modeling your position size. Okay, as a function of the other parameters. Okay, so here this is where you factor it in. Now, this 68.5. Okay, is not going to be the equivalent of the 54.50.4 because this is only the stop trigger you have to assume there will be some slippage so you assume that the figure will be eventually will trigger uh, get executed at 5445 let's say okay so this thing that you put in here the 68.5 this is going to the equivalent is going to be the equivalent of that 5445 this is your projection of where the actual stop will get uh, triggered uh, will get executed not triggered triggered is 5450 are you following? So this is how you budget for slippage. You have to budget. Well, everything has to be done from. I'm teaching you uh, speculation from a very uh, conservative uh, approach. But this will ensure that you never go bankrupt. If you use this kind of a conservative approach, I mean your defense is very strong. You'll never go bankrupt. Okay. So you may make less money, but this ensures that you never go bankrupt. Okay pretty much okay if you can follow these rules so this 68.5 exit price when you are modeling the position size okay this thing that you enter in the exit price field is not the stop trigger level it's not the stop trigger level it's your projection of where you think the stop will reasonably execute so in this case you look at this and you say okay given this market I think that given the size of my position, I think that 5450, that's the trigger. The worst case execution for this is 5445. Okay, I'm just giving an example. In real life, it may be better than that. Are you following what I'm doing? You're following the thought process? Yes, Pulkit, yes or no? Okay. Is this clear? So the 5445 is what goes into this field when you are modeling the position size because this here is all we are doing is modeling the position size okay this is our goal actually okay right so here when you enter the projected exit price on loss you enter the uh, reasonable estimate with factoring in a little bit of slippage you do not enter the stop trigger level okay so if you are selling you put it a little below the stop trigger level if you are buying you put it a little above the stop trigger level you put in your reasonable estimate of where you think the stock will execute finally at what price okay and so that's what gives you the budgeted loss per share which is 14.5 okay this is all pre-trade planning so we are doing some budgeting of the loss uh, we are doing loss budgeting essentially okay or risk budgeting so is this clear now so now the reason I'm telling you to stick to liquid markets and stick only to the nifty 50 is that here in the nifty 50 kind of liquid shares you are unlikely to have because this is only your budgeted loss per share now when the sh if the loss is the stop is actually hit there will be some actual loss per share figure now that is the actual loss per share now in a liquid market essentially what happens is that your budgeted loss per share and the actual loss per share there should not be that much difference 
or even if the difference is there it's in your favor which means you actually end up losing less than you budgeted are you following okay so this is the reason you want to stick to liquid markets because here essentially what that means is you have low slippage okay because in a liquid market anyway you would not have budgeted much slippage okay you would have budgeted only a little bit of slippage and therefore you have low slippage and therefore you have you are able to stick to your your budgeted loss plan is uh, working out because remember that based on this is based on uh, the idea that uh, if you start losing much more than the budgeted loss per share that means you are losing much more than 1% per share 1% uh, of your risk capital per transaction are you following because this is based on 1% per share you're losing more than that much more than that maybe you lose 2 3% that upsets your whole risk planning because that 1% actually eventually comes out of a uh, projection about number of trades percentage profitable trades all these things so it upsets all your risk planning if you start having huge slippage beyond your budgeted slippage is this clear so far okay so these are all important concepts which uh, make sure that you understand what we are talking about here okay and one more thing that you have to factor in here which we had not discussed the other day is the disk brokerage brokerage also has to be figured it factored into your risk planning because brokerage is guarantee whether you make a profit there's this concept of let me use this expression i think it's there in your um, uh, in your table as well we still haven't gotten down to the uh, what we are discussing this is there's another term that you're learning here round turn brokerage okay round turn brokerage means round turn means in and out okay so everything all transactions are in and out eventually all right so you have to uh, so the brokerage basically is your round turn brokerage okay so you have to look at the round turn brokerage not just for the entry so it is based on a per trade they will give you the figures on a per trade they may depends on how they display it on the website but you have to keep your eyes on making sure that you understand that this is the total round turn brokerage okay so you have to double the one side brokerage okay for entry for every time you trade this you have to double that okay because there will be an entry and so whether you are making a profit or you are making a loss the broker will still take his commission okay and that's not going to change so you have to also fa factor in the round turn brokerage which means essentially if you are losing 14.5 per share maybe the round turn brokerage is 1 rupee let's say okay so maybe it's 1 rupee so in this case what you have to do is you have to reach reprogram this it can't be 1000 divided by 14.5 actually it has to be 1000 divided by 14.5 plus 1 plus the round turn brokerage are you following what's happening here okay so this is how you do comprehensive risk planning okay so you have factored in slippage okay here we should write this exit price on loss including slippage so to emphasize that this is not this entry cannot be the stop trigger level you have to factor in some slippage okay so you see how comprehensively you are approaching your risk planning okay first of all you what you are doing different from most investors okay especially amateur investors and even many professional investors don't use stops which is why you see all these cases of funds losing huge amounts of money there are funds which close down because overnight they lose 40% of their capital okay some there was one uh, uh, hedge fund called amaranth which had a huge bet on natural gas prices and then they ended up losing 6 billion in like a couple of days okay and eventually they had to shut down so all these cases of these are all cases of poor risk management if you can maintain this kind of risk management the market can never do anything to you because you are always trading in a very controlled manner all you can have the worst case outcome here is you have a run of losses you keep on losing money that can happen but because you are bleeding a little bit only at a point of time so you can only bleed to death in small cuts you can't they can't the market can't just chop your head off okay which happens if you don't have poor if you don't have good risk planning okay so you can have in trading you can have these cases of you have a run of losing trades but if you are betting a very small amount every time then that does not upset your uh, should not upset your rhythm okay are you following what i'm saying so this is how you speculate in a professional manner with a uh, very tight control over your risk okay so we have factored in slippage we have factored in the brokerage as well okay and then we have done this okay so now you can see what is this actually 
last question and what is that? Number of shares. Okay, this is the total loss projected, okay? All right, okay. So uh, what are we saying here now? Where are we in terms of time? We have a little bit of time. So I have to show you the blotter as well, okay? Now, uh, I, I just want to briefly, uh, I don't know whether we should discuss this at this point of time, but we'll get into models later on. But uh, understand here that what you're doing is you're actually uh, modeling the position size, okay? This is clear, you have to learn to use the language properly. Do you, have you guys actually done models in finance? Have you done any finance models? Not yet. Okay, what is NPV? Is it a finance model? CAPM is also a model. Okay. So, but I don't think you guys have been taught the general properties of a model. How would you identify a model? Yeah, because you have not been taught uh, the general properties of a model. So when I cover models, when we cover to the, when we come to the buy sell decision, okay, that's where models are really used most of the time. But you can see some cases where. But I'm just giving you a preview of models. It's very important to have a theoretical understanding of models so that you can identify a model when you see it. Now, just now you guys said that you have not done models in finance, but actually you have done it. IRR is a model. NPV is a model. Yeah. CAPM cost of equity in CAPM is a model. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. APT is also a model. Okay. These are all models. Okay. So you've done models in finance, but you don't have. It's important to have a theoretical understanding of what a model is, a general theoretical understanding, so that you can identify a model when you see it and you look at the component parts of the model. Okay. So this is the problem in a lot of the courses where, where even the external courses and all where they talk about financial modeling and all. They're actually just teaching you a bunch of techniques but they don't give you a good theoretical understanding of models and they don't cover all the different types of models that are there so we'll cover all that but here you understand something very briefly that here what are we modeling in terms of the way we use the language what are we modeling here this guy the position uh, position size okay number of shares yeah 64.52 obviously you can't do 64.52 so you have to uh, uh, no, this you have to actually do. What do we have to do here, guys? We have to do integer basically. We have to integer this basic, uh, but we have to sum down, right? Actually, we can't make it 63. It can't be 63, so we have to make it 64. Okay, so I, I've actually forgotten the formula for that, but that's what you have to do. You have to understand what you have to do. If you're clear about what you have to do, eventually you can find the syntax of the formula. Okay, so um, uh, so this is the thing. So is this clear? So we are modeling in terms of the way we use the language here. We have modeled the uh, number of shares for entry, the position size. Okay, this element here, which we have to put in all the time, the system defaults to 100. But you have to understand that the, 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 you need to think about this actively and decide this figure. Okay, so this figure, how do you decide the number of shares to uh, when you put on the trade? Okay, this is how you decide it. So this is how here what we have done is we have modeled the uh, number of shares, the position size. Okay, this is the position size. We are modeling the position size as a function of what are the things it's a function of what you always model something as a function of something else okay so whatever you're modeling is the dependent or independent dependent, dependent variable and as a function of abc those are the independent variables is this clear okay so we'll have some other terms for that also later on so you're modeling this as a function of what all function of basically uh, arc okay function of this also what is that because this one percent remember is also a variable you can change this okay so it's a function of this it's a function of this one percent function of the entry price exit price okay uh, loss per share is determined when you have exit price and entry and and brokerage so you don't put loss per shares you put the primary variables so if you have brokerage and exit price per including the slippage okay so actually your variables here are the brokerage the projected slippage the stop trigger level okay then the entry price this one percent variable. this is actually a variable i made it one percent okay but we can have different values for it we can have it two percent three percent okay half percent so as a function of this and as a function of the initial annual risk capital pool are you following 
So these are all the variables. We these it's a function of all these variables. As, so we are modeling the position size as a function of all these variables. So this is clear now. So this is also a case of uh, modeling. Well, yes. Will we decide that we have to take one percent or two percent? So we will come to that. Uh, that's a longer discussion. So I haven't come to that yet. But that's why I've given you a thumb rule right now that you work with one percent. Okay. Basically, it needs to be a very low number. Okay. So I've given you a thumb rule. Uh, so is this so is this every, is everyone clear about this? Okay. So we have covered bracket orders. We have covered the, this loss budgeting element. Now we also need to cover the blotter quickly. Okay, we have actually I want to make progress on other things, but I should cover the blotter quickly. What you guys should do minimum stuff. Okay, so this is what uh, uh, Chug has done some work on this blotter. So I just changed his uh, thing. So I name the sheet. Okay, so date you can enter. Okay, uh, date is not so important. Ticker obviously is important. Okay, position size is. Uh, position size here you enter minus sign okay so if you're selling minus 100 minus 500 whatever it is position you enter you don't have to have a separate long position short position just enter it as a minus sign okay then position size uh, yeah, actually this is not 45 so no, yeah in India you can have 45 also so let's say we enter this as uh, minus 300 okay deal price and what is the price at which you have entered the position okay this is the entry price you can call it the entry price also so another shorthand for market lingo is price shorthand is px order shorthand is oda okay all right stop loss level this is the trigger level okay uh, actually here what you have to do is because we are going to use this later on to cover the maximum list this will have to be the um, this will have to include the slippage and brokerage uh, okay i put in the brokerage here uh, what you can do is basically you have to eventually when you project the maximum loss you'll have to uh, look at the uh, the uh, slippage and the round term brokerage i put in a separate column for round term brokerage so you can do your formula later on basically this the stop loss level and then this can be just put as the uh, including slippage only okay not including brokerage and then you add the brokerage because we got a separate column for that okay then we have the round turn brokerage everyone understands the round turn brokerage figure it out from the ib website go to the ib website and figure out the round turn brokerage okay cash impact here again you put if you are buying you minus sign for longs so if you are buying the cash impact will be negative because it's draining cash okay so your cash balance is going down your asset mix is changing essentially if you think of it in terms of a balance sheet your asset mix is changing it's going from all cash to some cash and some stock okay are you guys following okay so these are all the important things that you have to keep track of your this is good practice for you because it will help you this is called a plotter this is called a traders plotter where you keep track of all the trades that you're doing okay so this will help you to keep track this will be good discipline it'll help you to keep track uh, and manage your risk also right okay hopefully once you take care of the initial risk budgeting and you place your trades in such a way that the maximum loss is already covered okay then that automatically takes care of your risk budgeting a part of the problem that Tarun was having and uh, you were also having is basically because uh, I think he was focused more on the cash utilization and how much free cash was left to buy but part of these problems were which you were having in terms of looking at the uh, mark to market on the system okay is because you are not doing this uh, you are not trading with pre-planned stops and all that right that's why you got out of control once you have pre-planned stops and everything is entered the stop and the entry order everything is entered together then you can just forget about it that trade is gone it, either it executes or it doesn't execute the initial entry order then you kind of replan you have to keep reviewing the market but basically you don't have to worry about it once your stop order is already in the market you don't have to actively manage the risk are you following what i'm saying this makes your if you trade like this it makes it much easier also to manage the whole experience because most for most investors what happens is trading is a very stressful experience because you are losing money then you don't know what to do you are losing huge amounts of money suddenly now you feel that oh my god such a big loss how can i, how can I take such a big loss okay so it's a very it's a very um, oh see the what happened see now uh, we bought maruti so you can actually see a limit order execution in real time okay so now you can see that it has bought uh, the shares at 5501 or whatever it was you can see the trade log okay 
So again, you can see that just to buy 100 shares, how many trades it has to do, okay? So, all right, so you can see this. All right, so we bought this. Now, what, what was I saying? Uh, I got, anyway, the point I was trying to make is that uh, if you trade in this kind of systematic manner by pre-planning your risk, always putting stop orders in the market, it makes your uh, life as a trader much more relaxed. Okay, it's a much more clinical operation. Otherwise, you're always getting, you know, you're, you're like, you're being pulled apart by your emotions. Okay, so all this anxiety and all that. So it's it's not a good way to operate. It doesn't keep you, uh, you know, lowers the probability of success. Okay, so cash impact you can put. Initial risk you can factor in here as a function of the entry price, position size, and then the stop loss here, which enter stop level, including the slippage, but you have to add the round term brokerage. Okay, you have to program all this for yourself. This is your initial risk. Okay, and then uh, the, this is stuff that you can do. You don't really have to, uh, you know, worry so much. I mean, this is not a requirement. I'm not making you do it. But if you want to keep track, you can do this. Then the market price, you can do something else here. What is the current market price? Market price always means current market price. Okay, unless it's qualified. See, unqualified use of the term market price means current market price. Okay, otherwise, if I want to say what was the market price at 11.23 a.m. on 2nd of April, then I'm qualifying it and you know that it means to, that refers to that market price. So current market price here, you can use this concept of, uh, I have to see whether Sheets has it. So Excel used to have this concept of DDE links, you know, dynamic data exchange. Okay, so you can actually link to that. You can just read up on the Excel manuals and see how it's done. Okay, so you can, there are certain websites which uh, give you the option of uh, Yahoo Finance and all, maybe they give you the, even the NSE might give you that option. You can just update, so the spreadsheet will update the live prices using those DDE links. Okay, so you can explore all that. This is part of your learning of spreadsheet software and how to use technology and all that. But the concept should be clear what you're trying to do. Once you do mark to mark, once you do your market price, you have the concept of mark to market. Okay, which is where actually there's a problem with the system because it is showing only day to day mark to market changes. So it gets you a little bit confused. Like you can see here in this, you can see obviously I'm making money on my TCS uh, shares because I bought TCS uh, here. I bought it was somewhere here, 21 something, 2101 or whatever, and now it's 2187. I'm obviously making money, okay? But it is showing me as uh, having a uh, as as a daily PNL status is uh, What did I do? I just clicked on something and made it disappear. Okay. Anyway, doesn't matter. It's showing me as a loss. There's obviously because it's a loss from the previous day. Relative to the previous day's closing price, it's a loss today. Okay, so it must have fallen today. Okay, so yeah, because it's fallen today, so it's showing me as a uh, as having a loss. So that's why. So so that's why the mark to market is uh, is problematic uh, because you you want to have the market price and you want to be able to calculate the mark to market on your own blotter, which will give you a more accurate uh, value for your mark to market. Are you following? Mark to market is essentially nothing but I think I have it somewhere here. So when we discuss positions and views, obviously we have a technical definition of long and short. Long means purchase of base asset, short means sale of base asset. Uh, actually, this is the more def correct, def more general definition. Okay, Take, going long or short is making a bet that the base asset will appreciate or appreciate. This is the more correct definition, the more general definition. Okay, that taking a long position or a short position is basically betting that. Uh, the uh, if you take a long position you're betting that the base asset will appreciate okay because in many situations like futures contracts which is especially financially settled cash settled futures contracts you never take delivery of the asset okay so the contract is only making a bet for a bet on which way the price will move so the purchase of so long and short essentially here means in more general terms okay This is already mentioned, no? This part I can put into your notes here. So. We are coming to the coverage of M2M, okay? 
so this part is put into your notes okay so this is the idea okay so long and short now you know you can just read up on that okay now there's this concept have you guys heard of m2m m2m means mark to market which is nothing basically just understand it okay um, So we'll just quickly cover this concept of M2M. M2M is what you do if you have uh, like here, where are we with the blotter, okay? So in the blotter, this is the question that Tarun had, that he was not satisfied with the systems display of the M2M, okay? Because it's doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. Ideally, you're right. We would want to have the M2M reflect the initial entry price only. The, relative, the distance between the initial entry price and the current market price. So here you can learn a little bit more about excel investigate that dde link if you want to okay how you get dde links now and which websites give you that option okay um, and maybe even money control would give you that option so you can put the market price over here and then the m2m is nothing but the difference between the current market price and your entry price okay then and, and because when you enter the position let's at the instant that you enter the position the market price is the same as your entry price at the very instant okay if you look at one millisecond or whatever okay it's the same as the market price the entry price uh, the market price is equal to your entry price but then the market price starts moving around but the entry price obviously never changes because it's just a transaction that you did okay the entry price will not change but the market price starts moving around and then there's a divergence okay so m2m is nothing but basically this okay what you do mark to market means marking to market essentially you take the market price you can see the market element of the definition you take the market price and you revalue your existing position at the market price so if you had gone short 300 shares at a price of 22 20 22, 08, and then the current market is 1700 okay so you have to now initially that particular this 2208 okay the cash impact the in you have to in the cash impact you have to you don't put in the cat in the the brokerage in the cash impact maybe uh, because, and then you'll have to, otherwise you'll have to change this round turn brokerage because this if you put it in the cat uh, okay sorry so i just confused you guys because this is for the risk calculation so the cash impact should include the one side brokerage okay to be fair to the to to reflect it accurately uh, and then what, are, what was i saying yeah so uh, the uh, m2m will be just nothing but the the same 2200 uh, the 300 shares okay which you had gone short at 2200 but now you have to reflect the loss uh, the profit that exists on those shares between the uh, the current market based on the current market price and the entry price so this profit of 2200 where uh, the profit with, uh, gained by the difference between the 2200 and the 1700 that will have to be shown in the m2m this is basically like your unrealized pnl that's what it says here the mark, mark to market pnl essentially is the uh, the uh, unrealized pnl okay if you see here now we talk about two things unrealized pnl and the cash balance which is the realized pnl okay the realized pnl is basically relating to close positions okay essentially this will be reflected in your cash balance is everyone clear your your total there's a concept that you see here this is the concept that we should cover now so m2m everybody is clear mark to market nothing but basically taking the existing position and revaluing it at the current market okay so if you have gone short at a much higher price and the current market is lower you will see that m2m prof showing a profit mark to market profit we usually show the mark to market profit or loss okay we don't show the position value we show the mark to market profit or loss okay so in this case what we will have is basically this uh, 2200 minus 1700 into the 300 shares is this clear okay so you can write this uh, in such a way write the formula in such a way that when it's a loss it shows as a negative okay that you can do yourself you can program that yourself okay so when you have the mark to market profit or loss that represents your unrealized pnl okay mark to market is the unrealized pnl where have i said that yeah so the mark to market is the unrealized pnl okay 
because remember this this you have not locked in yet this profit that you have okay whatever profit I have let's say I bought TCS at 2101 and the market is now 2184 but I have not guaranteed this profit for myself because I have not sold my shares so there's still the position is still open right position you guys understand okay so the position is still open so I've not guaranteed these profits to me to, to myself okay so therefore the price is still fluctuating that's why it's showing in the mark to market PL and that's why it's an unrealized PL. that's why we say the mark to market shows you the unrealized PL. unrealized because the position has not been closed and therefore you have not locked in that profit so these are the expressions that we use that the price the profit has not been locked in okay because the position has not been closed okay so it is still an unrealized profit okay which means you have not realized the profit are you following the word the real the word realized okay so mark to market is basically your uh, the uh, the unrealized pnl okay so the what we should do here is also connect to the idea of nlv or nav so ib you will notice the ib tws shows you a if you click on the account you will see a nlv figure net liquidation value okay the more general term that we have in the industry is nav you might have heard about nav or mutual funds some of you who did research on uh, mutual funds nav is basically net asset value okay so let me just write it here net asset value and all that it is is it's the sum of your realized and unrealized pnl okay so you may have made some losses which would have taken down your cash your initial cash balance is one million dollars maybe you made a hundred thousand dollars worth of losses so your cash balance is down to 900 okay i'm assuming no brokerage here your cash balance is down to 900000 okay and then you have 100000 of realized losses but maybe you have an open position on which you are showing 400000 of profit okay so your nav is going to be 1 million minus 100000 realized profit uh, plus the the 400000 so your nav will be showing as uh, 1.3 million right but you have to understand that the 400000 is basically not guaranteed because it's an open position so the price can start fluctuating and then your profit might actually reduce or it might increase you don't know what will happen but the point is that you have a, you haven't locked it in so it is unrealized pnl so the important term we need to know is net asset value of any fund that we are talking about any fund where we talk net asset value has two components one is the unrealized pnl which we refer to as the mark to market pnl and then the uh, then there is the realized pnl which is all your closed positions which shows as your cash balance in some uh, accounts they will show it as a cash balance right right like uh, rajan saw a cash balance on that account which i was showing you the the oanda fx trade account you saw a cash balance that is the cash that's all the realized pnl okay right is everyone clear about this you're following so far okay so this blotter that we have talked about this you can just keep for your own i'm not putting any constraint on you that you have to keep it but i think it's a good practice it'll get you into the habit of tracking your positions okay and you can figure out for yourself what you want to see okay if you are very particular like tarun may be very particular about wanting to see the actual m2m in that case he can set up the dde links and make sure that his actual market price comes in okay maybe even ib will offer you dde links you can just read the website and figure out these guys are so advanced they should be able to offer you the dde links uh, directly okay so and then uh, so this is basically it now where are we in terms of time oh, we have four minutes oh great okay one minute one minute we have so many uh, so many things to cover we have a lot of ground to cover charts i need to quickly cover charts okay so we are looking at time series data charts okay four elements of a chart i'm going to quickly cover it now itself okay so you realize how this stuff is being done it is being done very quickly i'm just throwing concepts at you if you don't understand you should ask immediately in the class good that we are getting a lot of questions but then go home and revise make sure whatever concepts have been taught that you have internalized them you can do it with your hand tied behind your back right so okay now what are the elements of a time series chart okay initially we are mainly in finance we use we, we do use cross-sectional data charts also but we use a lot of time series data charts here is a time series data chart tcs okay because you have one variable over multiple periods of time 
at least one variable over multiple periods of time. As I showed you, if I compare this to the NSE, that is still a time series data chart. Okay, because it fits the definition of at least one variable. Two variables is co covered by at least one variable. Right? So I can show all kinds of I can show all the IT stocks. I can show all the IT stocks, Infosys, Tech Mahindra, everything here in one display. That's also a time series chart. Okay. All right. What are the elements of a time series chart? Data range being graphed. So we want to use this exact term, data range. Just nothing but start date and end date. Okay. For most charts that we use in finance, the end date is very easy. It's the current period. Okay. Most of the charts are live, have live data. Okay. So it's the current period. So the end date is the current period and it's just the beginning. Here we, we don't know exactly what it is, around 17 July 2018. Okay. So this is your data range, July 2018 to today. That's your data range, end date minus, uh, okay. What is the market of variable being plotted? Okay. In this case, the variable is TCS common stock. Okay. This is the variable. Now I can change this around and make it dollar yen. I can make it West Texas crude oil whatever it is then the market changes right everyone is following so far okay what else do we have to plot type okay the plot type is what type of plot is this which is here okay you can actually do this even we can you can do it with this one also okay we can look at it this is actually a candle chart okay this is one type of display which is a candle chart you can play around with this and see where uh, you have the different types of plots but plot type is basically how am i going to display the data how am i going to display the data i can also show something which is just a line chart this is also a candle chart i can just make it a line chart you everyone knows what a line chart is okay because i just plot the closing price for each period that's a line chart it's the simplest kind of chart i capture only one type of data which is the closing price okay at the end of one period okay but in the case of a candle chart i am plotting all kinds there you have your data but i'll just quickly finish this um, since you don't have any other class after this okay all right okay we'll, we'll, we'll continue with the next class okay Listen to the bell a little longer. No, I don't think this alarm has a music option. Uh, I'm not. I don't want to encourage you guys uh, with the music and all that because.